Hi friends at Columbia Sweeney and Brazoria Methodist Churches. This is Pastor Dan from Columbia Methodist. Each week, a pastor or church leader from one of our churches will be providing a short video like this one about what stood out to them in their readings and the message they believe God most wanted them to receive from his inspired word that week. Well, for the first couple of weeks, I'll be sharing my experience and insights from the readings with you which uh, I will share with you in just a moment. But first, let me just say congratulations for getting started and making it through week one of New Testament in 90 days. Please get on the NT90 email list with your church if you haven't already, because all the supporting resources for NT90 are available in those church emails. The reading plan, the weekly discussion or reflection guide, links to the pastors or church videos like this one, and other links to videos about the books of the Bible with background information that might be helpful, like from BibleProject.org. Uh, and so uh, this is the discussion guide for week one. It has a bunch of helpful questions and uh, insights that could lead you through uh, under each day's readings. Uh, so if you're meeting in a group, bring your own questions, and these questions are there to help you reflect on God's Word. Now on to the Gospel of Luke, chapters 1 through 11 for week 1. What I love about Luke is how concerned he is about putting forth the clearest and most complete and accurate account possible of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's right there in Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, where he says he's providing an orderly account so that we may know the certainty of things we have been taught. In verse 2, he shares where he's getting his information from those who were eyewitnesses of these things, and he was handing them down to others in the church and throughout the generations, and finally to us. He addresses the book to Theophilus, which means lover of God, which could be someone's name, or it could be a general word given to all who love God and want to know the truth about Jesus Christ, which would include you and me. So in a way, we can write our own names in there and imagine that Luke is writing to each of us, saying these words, I decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Bob, or Judy, or Roy, or Kathy. And in the next couple of chapters, we move through the parts of the Christ story that we most often hear around Christmas time. But Christmas in May works for us too, church, because the incarnation of the Son of God into our world is important and significant for all the days of the year. Luke understands that in order for Jesus' saving work of the crucifixion and resurrection and ascension to come, he first had to come into the world. Through his diligent interviews and record-keeping, he wants us to know about the kind of Savior we have through the circumstances and family that he was born into and in the fulfillment of many Old Testament prophecies, too. The humble, difficult, painful, and dangerous circumstances is a stark contrast from the glories and comforts of heaven that Jesus the Son emptied himself of in order to save the people in the world that God so loved. The prevalence and frequency of divine intervention through the activity and messages of angels indicates to us the significance of this baby and who he would grow up to be. What shines through for me in these chapters is how God is in control of these very significant events in his providence. He's aware of everything that happens and actively steers outcomes so his perfect plan of redemption will definitely happen. And yet God also chooses not to do it all directly through his power, but chooses to use humans much of the time for what God wants to see happen. I imagine trying to work through humans much of the time can be very frustrating business for God, but as flawed as we are in how we choose to use our free will, God's power and grace is greater. That is the message again and again and again in Scripture. In this message of Luke for week one, Jesus is the focal point of God's power and grace and salvation. This message is repeated and woven throughout, but I believe the words of the angel to Mary are a particularly good summary of it. 
You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Now, with so many chapters read in one week, I can't provide a summary here of all of our readings, or the video would be way too long. But if I could pick three words to summarize what I most heard the Holy Spirit speaking to me this week through His inspired word, it would be these. The first would be providence. Even when things look bad and life seems really hard, God is still working things out for the good. And in the long run, God wins. And His plans for redemption and His love and power are surely going to come. In my life, when things are hard, or I might fall into discouragement or a self-pity party, I need to remember God is in this with me and look for His hand at work in the circumstances around me. The second word is Jesus. God does not just give us a plan or a message. God gives us a person. Jesus the Son, the third person of the Trinity. It's not about religion. It's about a relationship with a person. And that person is Jesus. The chapters of Luke that follow tell us a whole lot more about who this person is in the incarnation of God in the world. The third word is really two words, Holy Spirit. There are so many references to the Holy Spirit surrounding the birth of Jesus, but also in his baptism, in the sign of the dove, and then in the 40 days in the wilderness is how Jesus survived and then left filled with the Holy Spirit and his claiming the Isaiah passage he read in the synagogue in Nazareth. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, and the Spirit led and empowered Jesus' ministry that followed. Well, the Holy Spirit was present in a powerful way at the Mount of Transfiguration in Luke 9, 2. This is a pivotal moment in which the ministry of Jesus shifted towards the journey to the cross. We are just getting started here with NT90, friends. And I believe the Spirit is going to be speaking to us and leading us with power in the coming weeks, too. Our readings for week two are the second half of the Gospel of Luke that trace the steps of Jesus to and through that cross to the resurrection on Easter Sunday and beyond. And so for Sunday, our readings for week two will have us ready for Pentecost and the movement of God's Spirit in our churches today. The same Spirit who inspired these human authors like Luke to write these words, this is the same Spirit of power who filled and led Jesus the Son throughout His life and ministry, is the same Spirit who is with us in the church today. So let us pray and wait this week for God's Spirit of power to come to us like the Spirit came to the disciples when they obeyed Jesus' command to stay in Jerusalem and pray and wait for Pentecost to come. Let us invite God's Spirit to come into our hungry hearts and lives and churches and in faith trust that the Holy Spirit will. I'll see you next week, friends, for week two.